looking forward to this evening uh, as I look forward to every evening when we've been here together. Um, I'm going to kind of bring all this, you know, uh, all our sessions together today. I'd like to talk, begin by talking about uh, Islam, you know, Islamic spirituality uh, that will help us with hope and healing, and then continue with Taoism and uh, also see how that could be used uh, in, you know, in, in, in the whole movement of uh, healing. Uh, I also would like to, so this will be the last session for this segment. I promise we will have more, but I need, a, I think I need and you need a little break, you know, a little separation, and then we can come back fresh to be able to talk about other things. What I would like to do is maybe, this time I talked about the Eastern approach to hope and healing. I'd like to do at least another maybe three talks on the psychological approach to hope and healing. So, so that, you know, those talks, I am, uh, I think I can, I can do that, I'm not sure when. Now those of you who don't have email, uh, like the emails, see if you can kind of partner with somebody who has an email so that you can get the information from, you know, from them. Okay, so I'll send out an email. Uh, Joe has got all the emails that you sent him. I've got my email kind of contact list, so I'll send things out uh, through those emails. Okay, let's begin. So I'm going to talk for some time, and then of course after that, we'll leave, I'll leave time for comments, for clarification, and for questions. So Islam. Uh, <coughs> Let me say out, uh, right, out uh, up front, like you know, that Islam is a religion of peace. It's a religion of unity. It's a religion of compassion. What is the beginning of Islam? Like when when the Prophet Muhammad was born, like you know, his his parents died, and he was brought up by his uncle and his and his grandfather, and they were trader traders. So he went with them wherever he, wherever they went. So he learned at a very early age, you know, all the tricks of the trade, and he he, he became very good. And so, as he was growing up, but he was also a seeker, and he spent a lot of time, of course, being an orphan, being alone. He had a lot of time to himself. And so he would think and think and think and think about all kinds of different things. And one of the things that he was really thinking very seriously about was the Kaaba. You know, that stone that Abraham had built, um, like, you know, as a monument to God. But that stone now was taken over by Christians and by Jews and by other people. And that sacred stone became the center of aberration. So they introduced other religious traditions. They introduced other cults, and so therefore, like there were many, there was idol worship, cultic rituals, etc., which kind of desecrated that sacred stone, which upset the Prophet Muhammad tremendously. So in that state of upset, he went into a cave during the time of Ramadan. So, so what do you know? Ramadan is not a Muslim, you know, uh, like a, a time uh, uh, um, uh, sp specifically Islamic, but it existed even before Islam was founded. So those are like those are 40 days where people spend in prayer, in fasting, etc. So during the time of Ramadan, the Prophet Muhammad goes into the cave, and that is called the Hira experience. And while he was in the cave, like you know, just thinking and reflecting about the Kaaba and about God and about how he had a vision, and, and there was the angel Gabriel who appeared to him. The same angel Gabriel, by the way, who appeared to Mary at the Annunciation. You know, sometimes there are priests who will say, yeah, an angel appeared to, the, you know, to Muhammad, but they didn't say which one. You know, it's not the good angel, it was the bad one. No, it was angel Gabriel who appeared to the prophet Muhammad and began to reveal to them the Quran. Now what is the Quran? The Quran means recitation. The Quran means, you know, recite, read. The Quran was, and that recitation and the reading and the pen that was given to, you know, the prophet 
was very symbolic. How did the, how did the people at the time of the Prophet Muhammad kind of uh, resolve conflicts with the sword? So in the Quran was a substitute for the sword. The Quran was saying, now you recite, now you resolve your conflicts by conversations, by the written word, you know, not by, not by fighting, not by killing one another, but by talking, conversation. So that's the first, you know, that's when, if you're talking about hope and healing, okay, what about today? We in India, one Christmas, we had this big holding at Christmas that's, that said, God saved the world with a baby, not a bomb. <laughs> you know, God saved the world with a baby, not a bomb. So in today's culture, yes, we need recitation. We need to conversation. We need the pen. We need to be able to dialogue and melt our souls and take away, like, you know, and destroy all the bombs in order to be able to establish unity. Okay, so then, the, then but once he got his revelations, who was the first person that he went to talk to? Was Khadija, his wife, you know, whom he married. There was a big difference in their, you know, in, in age, but that did not matter. She was one of his first disciples. Of course, you always need a woman to get something, yeah. you know, something, to, <laughs> something really done. So, so thanks to her encouragement, her, uh, her understanding, her acceptance, you know, he began to kind of talk. And of course, the first thing that he does is, he goes out and he starts talking against what? Against the pagan worship, against the idol worship, against the cults, uh, in, at, at the Kaaba. Of course, if you attack the cults, and if you attack the priests, and if you attack all those things, guess what? They get together, and they'll probably get rid of you. So he was persecuted. So while he was being persecuted, there were some other merchants that said, come with us to Medina. Leave Mecca alone. Come to Medina. <coughs> Why did they want him to in Medina? Because the tribes were fighting among themselves. They said, come and bring us together. They, he, they wanted him to negotiate, not with the sword, but through conversations to be able to form a, a, a united group of tribes. And that was the beginning. And so, when the, when, when, when the Prophet Muhammad went, goes from Mecca to Medina, it was in 622 BC, uh, AD, okay, or CE, okay. So, <laughs> Uh, 622, and that is the beginning of the Islamic calendar, or the Muslim calendar. That's the beginning of Islam. So the journey from Mecca to Medina, in order to bring the tribes together, in order to form this union, in order to establish peace, in order to establish harmony, in order to introduce God who is compassion, was the beginning of Islam. <clears throat> That's the beginning of Islam. In fact, uh, there are 130, you know, um, well, the Prophet kind of was, was heard all the chat, all, all, all the, the whole Quran and began to, to, to pass it on to people. And, and through, through this oral tradition, you know, it, went, it passed on from one generation to another generation until he died. And about a century after he died, Abu Bakr, the Caliph, said, we need to put this down in writing. And so he wrote, the, the Quran was written much later, just as the Bible was written much later. We had the oral tradition before we had the written tradition, okay? But the Quran was written not in chronological order. It was written, the longer chapters came first and the shorter chapters came later. Because for them, they said, why do you need chronology? Every word <coughs> is sacred. Every word is inspired. So you don't need chronology. Just learn every word, okay? Now, here's the thing. 113 out of the 114 chapters of the Quran begins with, to begin with, God, compassion, and merciful. So it's not God who is compassion. No, God is compassion. Just as we say, God is love and love is God. 
In the Quran, God is compassion, and compassion is God. That's what the Quran is all about. It's about compassion. It's about union. It's about peace. It's about harmony. Okay? What about God? What's the relationship between God and humans? In the Quran, they will say, God is closer to us than our jugular vein. Like God and I are not, not we are so close that you cannot distinguish, you cannot separate God and a human being. That's in the Quran. I told you, I've often quoted Kabir, the Muslim poet who said, I laughed when I heard the fish in the water being thirsty. How can fish in the water be thirsty? There's water all around. But Kabir says, it's easier to understand fish in the water being thirsty than for a human being not knowing God. Because God is closer to us than fish in the, the water is to fish. Here's the other thing about God in the Quran. You cannot, God doesn't have a name. You know, God doesn't have a name. And you cannot print, you cannot draw pictures of God or the Prophet Muhammad or any sentient being. You know, that's powerful. Like, therefore, you have, like, uh, you know, they will, what do we have to say? Calligraphy? Yes. And so the Quran is written, in, so they've developed, like, you know, art, architecture culture, all these different things, but there are no images. And that's beautiful. That's mystical. How many of you read my blog that I posted yesterday or the day before? Okay, if you read that blog, it, I've, I've talked, I, was not, I wasn't thinking about what I was going to say today, but that's what I wrote in my blog. As soon as you name something, you've, dis you've diminished it or you've destroyed it. As soon as you've named God, You've diminished God, and you've destroyed God. And so therefore, like you know, we saw in Hinduism, there are 330 million gods, but none of them is God. There are 330 million ways to experience, uh, or expressions of experiences of God. And who's God in Hinduism? That. That's God in Hinduism. No name, no form, you know, no meaning. So you cannot give meaning to God, it is just that. That's Hinduism, that's Islam. So in Islam, like you know, God is Allah, but Allah is not, it's like Yahweh. Yahweh is not a word that you can pronounce. You know, we have pronounced, it's not a word that you can pronounce. As soon as you pronounce the name of God, you've diminished God or you've destroyed God. <clears throat> Similarly in Islam, you know, you cannot pronounce the name of God, there is no you know, there's no God. By the way, Allah comes from the same root as Elohim in the Bible. So they have the same root and they have the same characteristics. Like if you know, like you know the Bible, the Elohistic tradition, you cannot see the face of God and live. So God will appear to people. How? As a pillar of fire or as in a cloud. But you cannot see face, God face to face. Because God is Elohim, God is Allah, God is the great other. God, God will talk to human beings, how? In a dream. In a dream. And the other characteristic of the Elohistic tradition in the Bible is, you've got to be perfect as God is perfect in order to be blessed by God. It's the same tradition that flows into the Islamic tradition. Okay? So... You cannot name, as soon as you've named something, you've diminished and you've destroyed it. And so in the, what do you call that? In the Islamic tradition, you cannot name God. And that is, and that is a very beautiful way of growing in our relationship, you know, with God. So we've got, in Hinduism, we've got disposable images of God. In Islam, there is no image of God. Okay? And the relationship between like God and humans is so intimate, is very intimate, that we need to be able to discover that. So I'll talk a little bit more about how do we reach that intimacy? What are the helps that are given to us in an Islamic tradition for that? Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Say, so, where did all these terrorists come from? 
<laughs> you know, if it's found, and it's a legitimate question. How did this happen? You know, if Islam is a, is, a, is a tradition of peace, harmony, God is compassion. There is, in fact, in the Quran, there is a verse, I think it's, verse, it's chapter 49 that says, God says, I created multitudes of tribes so that you may learn. Not that so that you may dominate, not that so that you may kill them, but that you may learn more about yourself than about life and about God. Okay? So if, if this is what Islam is all about, um, why, where did everything, where, 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 did, where did the other things come from, like, you know, the other group? I'll talk about that, but let me talk a little bit about another word that we've also heard, jihad. You know, jihad, everybody said jihad, kill. What is the original meaning of jihad? It's the struggle. It's the struggle, it's an inner struggle. See, in Islam there are two things. There's the inner and the outer. So jihad, the inner struggle, is the greater war. The struggle to attain harmony within, peace within, compassion within you. And the lesser jihad, a lesser struggle, is to, to maintain the harmony in the external world. So who is the infidel? It's not a non-Muslim. The infidel is one who disturbs harmony, peace, and compassion. So one who is kind of, you know, who, who, who breaks the harmony and the unity and the peace and, and, uh, of, of the people, that is the infidel, and that's the one you've got to fight. Begin by recitation, by talking. But sometimes talking does not always help. And then you kind of, you know, you have the, but it's a great, it's a struggle. But the infidel, the jihad, is about maintaining harmony. And the infidel is not a non-Muslim. The infidel is one who disturbs the harmony and the peace of, among people, among nations. You know, like Muslims, Jews, Christians, everybody. If there's a person who disturbs the harmony, that person becomes the infidel. And you've got to fight that person, struggle with that person. So what happens, how did, how did these terrorists come about and how do we have different brands of Muslims? By the way, Islam in India is very different from Islam in Pakistan, very different from Islam in Afghanistan, and Iran is different from Iraq, you know, so there are different brands of, of Islam. How did, how, what, what, what makes the difference? It is the Sharia. Now you've heard the Sharia law, right? What is the Sharia? The Sharia is made up of the Quran. You know, what is in the Quran? Plus the Hadith. What is the Hadith? The Hadith is stories about the Prophet Muhammad, how he lived out the Quran. Okay? So, what would be a parallel, let's say, in the Christian tradition? Okay, you have the gospel that Jesus preached, but then you have the hadith of Jesus. What is the hadith of Jesus? The four gospels. You know, Matthew's hadith, Mark, Luke, and John. So they tell you stories about how Jesus lived out the good news. That is the hadith. So, and that becomes, you know, therefore we have in the Christian tradition, or not, not the Christian tradition, the Catholic tradition, like what, what really forms the law is scripture and tradition. That's why you women cannot be ordained in the Catholic Church, not because you don't, you're not in scripture, but you're not part of the tradition. So therefore, <clears throat> because you can always start a new tradition quietly, but anyway. <laughs> so, so the hadith was stories about the Prophet Muhammad. So after the Prophet died, there were like about 6,000 different stories and traditions about the Prophet, how he, you know, how he lived out the Quran. But then many of them were apocryphal. Not all of them were genuine. So they got all that together and they sat and they sat and they sat until they decided they're going to accept six main 
hadith, stories or traditions. So those stories and traditions now become part of the Sharia. But that's okay. There are two other things that kind of, you know, that, that, make, that, that will cause the differences. One is what they call kiyas. And the principle of kiyas <coughs> is by extension. So for example, alcohol is not forbidden in the Quran. You know, alcohol is not forbidden in the Quran. What is forbidden in the Quran is an intoxicant, intoxicating fruit that you found in the, de in the desert. You know, like in India, it would be the betel nut. You know, you eat that betel nut, that supari, you eat that for some time, yeah, you'll get, you'll start, you'll get, you'll, you'll get a high. So that was forbidden. And so the principle of Kiyas said, by extension, any intoxicating substance is forbidden. You got it? So, you know, so this is not really forbidden, but by extension. Okay, even this is not bad. What makes the difference is Ijma. Ijma is community. Like the Prophet believed that an individual can make a mistake, but he said, my community will never make a mistake in living out the Quran. How wrong he was. So now the elders of Iran will decide very differently from the elders in Iraq, but differently from Afghanistan and Pakistan and, and Malaysia and all different parts of the world. Okay? So therefore, you get all these differences. Terrorists are not produced by Islam. Unfortunately, in the Islamic tradition, there are no priests or maybe fortunately or unfortunately. <laughs> there are no priests in the Islamic tradition. You have the Imam, who is like the leader, but then you also have the madrasas. What is the madrasa? The madrasas are these schools, like catechetical schools. You know, the catechists, the RCIA people. Yeah, I mean, you know, you've got terrorists among the RCIA people too. Because they will, <clears throat> they will train you to say, we and only we and nobody else, okay? So anyway, so the madrasas have the mullahs that will interpret the Quran for people who know nothing about the Quran. See, the Quran is written in Arabic, okay? And one of the things about what the Prophet said is the Quran will never be translated. Because in translating, you interpret. In translating, you interpret. And of course the question is, what if people don't know Arabic? They said, it doesn't matter. They said the Quran is understood and experienced in the heart, not in the head. <coughs> so you just repeat those words, and those words will have an effect on you. As soon as the mind kicks in, the, the head kicks in, you know, you start fighting over words, etc., etc., etc. So just like a child, take that in, and let it affect you and affect your life. So terrorists are created by these mullahs who will give a totally different interpretation, you know, by. Of course, terrorists, by the way, were also created by the Crusades. When during the Crusades, that was the first time when Islam was condemned as an evil religion. At that time, Islam had reached its golden age. In fact, in, when they were in Spain, you know, they had the greatest books in, uh, in astronomy, in mathematics, in art, in culture. They were, the, they were the civilized people. And of course, they were a threat to everybody else. So what do we do? Get rid of them. Kill them. And the Crusades, of course, in the name of God, you know, people went to kill the Muslims. And if you couldn't go on the Crusades, what do you think people did when they were at home? They killed the Jews. <laughs> yes. Because in the name of God, they condemned the Jews. And then they built up all the stories, how the Jewish community secretly would kind of, you know, sacrifice a baby, you know, and make, I don't know, unleavened bread out of their blood and things like that. Rubbish. But there were stories that we believed. You know, there were stories that we believed. In the Catholic tradition, if you had any Jewish blood in your, you know, in your family, 
you couldn't be ordained a priest. You couldn't join the seminary. Of course, St. Ignatius. <laughs> <laughs> Three of his closest companions had Jewish blood in their family. But he wasn't Catholic. No, he was Catholic. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but he was one that lived by the Spirit. You know, not so much by the laws. But they were traditions. So, again, then the Catholic tradition, like to just to, you know, to kind of to put down the, the, the Islamic tradition, what do they call the Muslims? Mohammedans. Mohammedans. No. They were not the followers of Muhammad. They were the followers of God, who revealed himself through the Quran. Okay? So, again, by calling them evil, by, by branding them. In, in Spain, you know, uh, Jimenez, this is Cardinal Jimenez de Cisneros, who was the Grand Inquisitor, he was responsible for, uh, for the expulsion of the Moors, or the Muslims, from Spain. So he took the Quran and he burnt them in public. But all the other books of science, art, literature, culture, he kept in his library. You know? So they have recognized the contribution of the, of the Islamic world, but they kind of they, they, but they, it was too threatening. It was too threatening. And it was more political than anything else. And what do you think, like, why does, why does Islam get a bad name today if it is not political? Have you met a Muslim? Have you lived with Muslims? Have you kind of, you know, <clears throat> I grew up with Muslims. The best friends of my family are Muslims and Hindus. You know, we've got like, we have about two, three Catholic families in that old, you know, we live in apartments in that old <laughs> building. So if anything happens to anybody in my family, who's the one that will come first to help us? the Muslim or the Hindu and we reach out to them when my of course you know I joined the Jesuits as a teenager so my poor parents were spared of my teenage tantrums but my brother was at home so my parents had to deal with my brother's you know teenage years so who would my mother consult the Muslim mother because her son was also a teenager and every night they would be on the phone talking about their children a Muslim, Hindu, Christian, we had no difficulty. We lived together happily until the politician came. Now we are fighting. You know, there is the Sunnis and the Shiites. You ask any average Muslim, are you a Sunni or a Shiite? They don't know. They just know that they're Muslims. Oh no, the politician will tell you. No, no, you are a Muslim. Those Muslims are not, are your enemies. It's like the Christians. I was just told about two days ago, he says, Paul, did you hear at Lindenwood? Do you know that I was at this meeting and we were told that Catholics are not Christians? Because I said, yeah, I know. And we also believe that nobody else like, you know, will get to heaven unless you go through us. Because we know <laughs> everything. So we also kind of fight with one another. and we. So the division does not come from religion. Or it comes from religion. It doesn't come from the scriptures. It doesn't come from the scriptures. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad did not want to start a religion. He just gave them the word that was recited to him so that it would help them to live a, a group, a, a kind of, you know, like in harmony. Jesus did not want to start a religion. He gave us a pathway, you know, to help. The Buddha did not want us to start, did not want to have a religion. He gave us a pathway. None of those founders wanted to, but we took, because it's a good commodity. You can make money, you can have power, you can have authority, and add a little bit of guilt and fear, you know, as like a garnish, and you can got it made. You got the perfect recipe for that. Okay? So, so, like, we cannot condemn Islam with, okay, uh, let's, like, I'm sure you have some questions about this, so we can talk more about you know, your questions. What, are the, what is the path to be able to reach this harmony, this union, and how do we live our life? So the, the, uh, the, the Quran, or the Islam, has what we call the five pillars. The five pillars of Islam. So the first pillar is, uh, or the kalima, is faith. Okay? 
So the proclamation of your faith. What is the faith? There is no God but God. There is no God but God. That's it. Now later, of course, they added, and Muhammad is his messenger. <laughs> You know, similarly in Christianity, what do we believe? There is like, you know, love, like what do you call that? Love God with all you have no other belief. Yes, love God with your whole heart, with your whole soul, with your, and love your neighbor as yourself. Be, you know, and we also believe in like, you know, yes, in one God. But then we bring in Jesus. And then, of course, now we are different from the rest of the world. You know, and I'm not saying, by the way, I told you already right from day one. <coughs> My life is founded on the person, the life, and the teaching of Jesus. There's no two ways about it. So I'm not kind of, you know, I'm not shooting Jesus down, except he shoots me. Because my Jesus is not the rock of my life. My Jesus kicks butt. He's the, he's the springboard of my life. He'll never leave me in peace. He's always kind of throwing me out into, you know, into a greater world. All right? So that's my Jesus. My Jesus is through, my Jesus threw me out into Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, all these world religions. Not that I would get converted and follow their pathway, but that helps me to understand my own Christian tradition in a better way and give a more meaningful expression of my Christian tradition. So I'm a better Christian thanks to the Muslims, the Buddhists, the Hindus, and all the different people that I, and the atheists, by the way, have also helped me to become a better Christian. I've said this more and more, like too many times over here, I don't believe that there's such a thing as an atheist. In fact, I believe that the atheists have a more refined understanding of what we call God. If so, I remember I started this whole thing about God is nameless. As soon as you name God, you've destroyed, you've diminished God. The atheist does not name. And so therefore, sometimes I believe that some of the atheists who are really committed atheists have got of the fullness of the experience of the divine being and the essence. You know? <laughs> Think about it. Yeah, because it shows, it shows in the way that they live their lives. It shows in the way they're committed to life. It shows in the way like, you know, they pay the price for their atheists. So, yes, um, so faith. Now faith, by the way, is not a dogma, it's not a creed, it's not, a, it's not catechism. You know, what is faith? Faith is a relationship. Faith is a relationship, you know? And that relationship is, a, is an ongoing, ongoing relationship until we come to the nameless, the formless, almost meaningless that. And when we come to the meaningless, the formless, the, the nameless that, then you know that you have arrived. Your life will change. Your life will change. It's an ongoing, ongoing, ongoing process. When you reach that, how will we know that we have reached that? By the life of compassion by the life of love, by the life of reaching out, by the life of harmony, by that inner freedom that we, that we can experience, then we know that we reach that. God who is beyond names. Okay? So faith, and that faith, by the way, for them, has to be understood, has to be repeated aloud, has to be kind of, you know, proclaim till you die. So there is no part-time Muslim. You either are or you're not. You either are or you're not. And your faith is like a way of life. A way of life. So it is that relationship with, with God who is beyond God. Okay? Who is that. Uh, the great other or the, I just like it. I just, I, I cannot tell you how, like, you know, the devotion that I have in calling God that. It's that. Tat. In, in Sanskrit, tat. And in the Hebrew, 
God who revealed himself to Moses has said, I am that. I am. Yes. So it is, no, he, he said, I am. But he says, I am that. You know. So we have translated it, I am who am. But the, the, the literal translation is, I am that. So when we go beyond, yeah, all those names. So that's faith. Okay? So how does it help us in our hope and healing? Do you have a relationship with God? Is that a part-time or a, or a full-time? Is that like only when you go to church or the temple or the mosque? Or is this relationship with God like 24 hours? And if it is, you have a relationship with God, is that relationship growing? Because if it is not growing in all likelihood, your relationship with God is probably an idea or a God that is dead and you're just going through the motion. Because God is always bigger than anything we know of God. God is always deeper than anything we can experience of God. So if our relationship with God is not growing, then it, we need to stop and ask ourselves, do I really have a relationship with God, or am I just going through the motions? Do I just have the words, and I've forgotten and lost the music? You know? And I'm singing the song, but my heart is not in it. And I'm not in it. So that's the first thing. In order to reach this ultimate union with God who is closer to us in our jugular vein, we need to make a profession of faith. Okay? Like I said, it's not a creed. It's not a dogma. You know, you don't get up in church, I believe in God, and then you say the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. And I used to say the first line and then shut up. Because I kind of, I didn't, I probably don't even know the rest, but that's my public confession. I'll do penance later. But for me, it is like, you know, believe in God is like the supreme and the, and, you know, that's, that's really, that, that, that's really what it's all about. Uh, okay, the second is Salat. Salat is prayer. You know that Muslims pray five times a day. Okay? Now, why do they pray five times a day? Because they want to make God a way of life. So you don't kind of, you know, it's like the monks. The monks in the monastery pray five times a day. You know, priests are supposed to, like, pray the breviary five times a day. Unless you're a Jesuit. No? So because, <laughs> because they don't pray in choir. They don't pray the, you know, the thing in choir. And, uh, the, like, the, but they, so you go to the Dominicans. Yeah, five times a day they'll come down to the chapel, they'll wear their, you know, their dresses and they'll come and they'll chant. You know, it's a beautiful chant, a beautiful prayer, five times a day they will pray. But that is because between that prayer, what you pray continues in that in-between time. So when the Muslim prays like the five times a day, it is, uh, it is to make prayer a way of life. And what is prayer, by the way? Prayer is not an end in itself. Prayer is a means to deepen my relationship with God. You know, it's a beautiful. Talk about harmony, talk about peace, talk about compassion. How does the Muslim prayer begin? It begins with the azan, like, you know, the call for prayer. If you've been in any Muslim country, that call is haunting. That call is kind of, you know, it gets into, into the very marrow of your being. It's like, you know, it comes from the distance and goes into the depths of your being. It is like, come to Allah, come to God, come to God the merciful, come to God the com God who is compassion. Come, come, come. That's the call for prayer. And then when they come, you know, they have, uh, of course, you have all that purification. But, um, all right, so the purification, so if you've seen any, any pictures or movies of the Muslims before prayer, there's always, there are taps out there. So they wash their feet, they wash their hands up to their elbows. They have to purify themselves because now they're going to go to God. Then they purify all the, open, like, you know, the nostrils. They will clean their nostrils, their ears, their eyes, because they want to breathe in God. They want to listen to God. They want to see God. And so this symbolic purification, they cleanse themselves in order to be filled with God. Okay? Then when they come, they all face, uh, like if you go to, the, to a, into a mosque, they call, they, there's, what's the most sacred place in the mosque? The mihrab. The mihrab is that little thing where they have the qibla. The qibla is like a pointer. And where does it point? Mecca. 
So when the Muslims pray, they, wherever they are, in any part of the world that they are, they will all face Mecca. They will all face Mecca and they will I've got this. Anyway, there was this guy who went to the, the Wailing Wall, you know, in Jerusalem, and he was there praying. And he was praying, he said, I want to be where my people are, I want to be where my people are. So they asked him, like, you know, where are your people? You're already here. He said, Miami. <laughs> So, when, when the Muslims come together to pray, they all face Mecca. Why? For unity, for union, for harmony, for peace. And when they pray, you know, there is no anger, there's no hatred, there's no, there's nothing. Okay, how do the Muslims pray? They bow, they bow, they bow, they bow all the time, you know. Um, and that, by the way, is better aerobics than you have in your camera. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, try bowing. You know, it helps. It's like, it's, you, so, but now bowing, bowing, as I've explained once before, is a tremendous, tremendous kind of uh, uh, like symbolic action that, so when I bow my head, like Ignatius will also tell us before you begin your prayer, you bow. You know, because when you bow your head, you empty your head of everything that is in your mind and in your head. All your thoughts, all your philosophies, all your theologies, everything that you learned, all that you've read, everything that you've heard, you surrender it. You empty your mind. Why? Because now in prayer, you're going to fill yourself only with God. Only with God. Then you bow a little lo lower and you empty your heart. You empty your heart with all your attachments, with all your feelings, with everything that, you, that, that is dear to you, you surrender that. You know, that's what it means to be a Muslim, to surrender, to surrender, to surrender. Islam is closer to kind of a not so much obedience. So Islam comes from shalom, shanti. It is like, you know, salam. So it is all peace it is it is peace but muslim is to to surrender you know so submission so it's a submission where you surrender your you surrender your your heart and then you go right down and you surrender yourself totally you empty yourself empty yourself of everything to be filled only with the divine essence with the divine essence and trust me it's not easy for many of us to bow I found it almost impossible because I have my own pride to give up what I know. Oh no, I've spent so many years studying over there, you know, and if I give up what I know, what am I going to talk to people about? Nothing. <laughs> Surrender it and God will fill it. Let it go and let God. So five times a day, they go back, they go up and down, up and down, and there was somebody who told me recently, I'm not sure. Like, you know, who went to pray with the Muslims, they invited them to pray with them. And they said, oh, we'll come. So they thought it was going to, no, it was like one of these, you know, Baptist service that went on for three hours. So they, so that the whole Sunday you went there to pray, but it didn't finish in about 10 minutes. Half an hour, no, they were there for about two hours, just bowing and listening to those words and just repeating, Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar is Allah the Great, beyond. No other, like 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 God, okay. There is no God but God. So, so the bowing, you empty yourself. So when you pray, you want hope, you want healing, you want to grow in your relationship with God. Try bowing. It took me years. That's why in the Bible, Jesus, God talks about the stiff-necked people. Remember that? They wouldn't bow. They just knew. They held on to the, to the pride of their whatever they had. They would not let it go. Of course, it's risky. It's risky. And you got to bow and empty yourself, not only of the evil and the negative part of what you have in your head and your heart and yourself, but also the holiest of the holy. You got to let it go. In order to be filled with that which is greater, 
that which is holier and that which is, you know. But unless you get rid of the holy, you cannot come closer. You cannot be filled with that which is divine and that which is the essence. <coughs> Not easy. Like because we feel secure, you know, in, our, in, in what we have. Because if I give that up, I'll probably be left with nothing. And you will be left with nothing. And what is nothing? It's no thing. God is not a thing. You know, so there's no thing. You, life is not a thing. You and I are not things. You and I are the essence. And that's why Paul would say, you know, in Galatians 3.28, that in Christ Jesus, no thing is, there's neither Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female. That is no thing. Jew, Gentile, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, those are things. When you bow and you fill yourself and you let go of what you have, you will come to where Paul, you know, Paul arrived and the mystics arrived, where you, you and I will be able to look at one another as persons. Not just persons, but as divine beings, as spiritual beings. Okay? Uh, so that's like, you know, that's so, that's praying five times a day. And every Muslim prayer, like the Buddhist prayer, ends with peace to the right and peace to the left, you know. And it's so beautiful. I told you many times, like, you know, I find the sign of peace at the Mass to be very beautiful, but it's at the wrong place. The Eucharist kind of builds itself up. You know, to you're getting ready now for that communion with the divine. And just before that, you have the seventh inning stretch. <laughs> so <laughs> you get up, oh, peace with you, oh, yeah, let's like, and they go around, and all that was built up in such a beautiful way is gone. I think that sign of peace needs to be shifted, moved, either to the beginning or the end of Mass. I think your peace at the beginning. Or take your peace with you as you leave to the rest of the world. So the Muslims have it at the end. The Buddhists end all their prayer with peace. They have what they call as the Maitri Bhavana prayer, which is like, you know, the prayer for friendship, love of all beings, of all creatures and everything. That's, that's the way they end their prayer. And the Muslims will end their prayer with, you know, with, with peace and peace, and that's the way they would end their prayer. So that's prayer, okay? What's the third pillar? The third pillar is zakat. Zakat is tax. So they have the religious tax. So they're supposed to give part of their, you know, the percentage of their money in alms. So it's alms giving. What is the what is the spirituality behind behind zakat? Behind the Muslim alms giving. So the Muslims don't give alms to you know to build alms. If you go to any of the mosques, there will be people sitting outside, you know, outside the mosque, and they all like give them money, food, etc. So the principle behind zakat is, first of all, all our material possessions do not belong to us. They've been given to us to kind of, you know, to keep them in our safety, to use them for, to be able to promote God's work. Arms giving is also to be able to identify yourself with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the needy or the less fortunate. So the, the couple of things is an appreciation of what you have, but what you have is meant to be shared. Is meant to be shared. And so therefore the Muslims kind of, you know, they, they share what they have, symbolic both for, and it is mainly for their spiritual growth. So it's not just to be able to help people, but the, the, the spirituality behind that is, I do not own my wealth. I'm just a custodian of God's wealth that I need to be able to share with other people. You know, like in Hello Dolly, she says, wealth and money, excuse the expression, is like manure. It's meant to be spread around. <laughs> help little things to grow. But if you keep it, it begins to stink. And it kind of does more harm than good. And that's the Muslim tradition. Zakat, the tax, is almsgiving 
in order to be able to share the wealth that we, that we have so that nobody lacks anything. It's like the Acts of the Apostles. They share. Um, I'll come to what you call that. When you come to Taoism and you look at the Tao Te Ching, the Tao Te Ching teaches us to live with enough. If we learn to live with enough, this world would be heaven and earth. If we shared what we had with those who don't have, neighbors, communities, nations, the world, we would not have homeless people, poor people, because if we shared you know, what we have, the world would be a different place, a totally different place, you know, a, a different experience, because we are all in this together. We are sharing what we have, you know, and when we, sh so that's zakat. Zakat is to be able to share in order to build this community, this communion, harmony, peace, compassion, you know, and that's the way we also come to God. So it's also in, it's always in relationship with God. You've given this to us, we need to share this with the rest of the world. So what God has given to us is not only for ourselves, but for others. Now, again, uh, this is also very Ignatian. You know, it's not about money, but what Ignatius says is, all the gifts that God has given us, our spiritual gifts, our qualities that we have, they are meant to be shared. And if you don't share them, you lose them. But those gifts that we share, we, we only own that which we have given. That which we have given away is what we own. Okay? So that's why Ignatius never allowed Jesuits to make annual retreats. No. In fact, he didn't even allow them to pray. You know, so they were not allowed to spend one hour of uh, every day in prayer. He said, no, you will not. And he was very upset. But he wanted every Jesuit and every follower to be giving the exercises, to be giving the retreats. Because first of all, you cannot give what you don't have. And second, when you give, you own what you give. You know, so it is in the giving that we receive. It is in the giving that we, get, that we are confirmed. And those gifts that we share with other people, those become the platform for bigger and greater gifts. So if you haven't shared your gifts with the rest of the world, you know, with the rest of the world, you're going to lose them. I mean, just think about a practical thing. All those gifts that you are treasuring in your home, that have been given to you by your mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and you're kind of saying, when you die, there will be no U-Haul truck that brings it to your grave, and there will be a garage sale, and it won't even sell over there. So share them while you're still alive. Give them in the way when you still have the opportunity, because those gifts are just given to you, not to hold, but to share them with the rest of the world. To share them with the rest of the world. Okay? So that is zakat. Zakat is that, you know, the, the religious tax. It is not tithing. It is like, you know, they don't give it to, most of the times they'll give it to the poor people that are outside the mosque. You know, so they give to, get there, so they, and if they give it to the, if to the, to the, you know, to the, to the mosque, it's also used to help the poor people in different parts of the world. Okay? So those, that zakat is not used to build mosques and, you know, and, and, and uh, wonderful buildings and, you know, to get jet for, like, for, like, for one of their leaders, etc. No, that's specifically for the poor. Uh, if you need money for something else, then they have a different fund to collect that money for other things. But anyway, so this is so this is one of the principles for us to look at our things, not just our material things, not just the money. You know, I'm not saying like you know give away everything. No, enough. That's the key word. Enough. Do we have enough? You know, and then we, we have enough and be happy, and share the rest, and we and the world will be a happier place. Okay, third. It's already seven. Uh, uh, the, the fourth. The fourth is uh, Hajj. No, not Hajj. No, Song is fasting. Oh, the Muslim fast is such a wonderful thing. See, what is the spirituality behind the Muslim fast? 
So when the Muslim fast from sunrise to sundown, you know, the Muslim fast is to identify yourself with the rest of the world that does not have enough. To identify yourself with the suffering, the poor, people who don't have food, you identify yourself with that. Fasting has got another, what do you call it, another spiritual meaning for the Muslims. Fasting is, just as my body craves for food, I'm expressing my, my spirit craves for God. So it is in the fasting that I'm craving for this compassionate God. I want to be, I'm thirsting for God. I'm hungry for that God. Okay? Now the other thing about the Muslim fast, like when they are fasting, they cannot, what do you call that, they cannot think evil, speak evil, do evil, no sex during fasting time, you know. So there's all this, it's only about God, you know, it's only about God. So if you want to have sex and God, then you've got to be a Hindu, follow the, you know, the Kama Sutra. So, you know, that, that, that's your pathway to God. But for the Muslim, while they're praying, so while, while, while they're fasting, it's like it's just pure. It's just pure hunger for this God that is full of compassion, God that is full of love. And then to identify yourself again with the rest of the world for peace, for harmony you know, for, to build this wonderful community. Uh, see, the Prophet Muhammad, he went from Medina into Mecca during Ramadan and the time of fast. Why? Because they told him, they said, if you go, they're going to kill you. <coughs> you know, because during the time of Ramadan, and you go there, and you go, and you and you follow, and, and you and you go there, you cannot carry arms, you cannot fight. So, since he was adamant and insistent, he went into 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 Mecca, and thousands of his companions joined him without arms, and then he takes over Mecca without shedding a drop of blood. It was almost like Mahatma Gandhi, you know, his Satyagraha. He conquered the British without, like, you know, without firing a bullet. Because he went there in peace. He went there in peace. And Mahatma Gandhi used to fast, you know, in order to be able to identify himself, etc. So anyway, so fasting, fasting for the for the Muslims is not just like it is it is a complete fast. Like when I was growing up. They also wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't even swallow their own saliva. Yes, they were, those were the strict, you know, when I was growing up in India. Like, you know, they would just, like, you know, spit the saliva out, but they wouldn't take it in because it would break their fast. Mm -hmm. And then they break their fast, you know, with a date. No, not the date that you and I understand, but, you know, it's that fruit. <laughs> I want a date, you know. <laughs> yeah. So that little date, they always have something sweet. Why? as an expression of gratitude for the sweetness and the gifts of God. So breaking that fast with that little date is something that is, like, you know, it's an expression of gratitude. So that, you know, when you've seen, like, I've, I've grown up with these Muslims who fast and who, like, you know, and of course, when the Eid comes up, you know, then there's a banquet. Oh, we would wait for their food because they really know how to cook. You know, they, we had the we had the best food during during their Eid celebration. So that is fasting. And finally, the Hajj. The Hajj is a pilgrimage. So every Muslim would like to kind of save money, enough money, at least once in their lifetime, to go to Mecca. <coughs> but not every Muslim can afford it. Not every Muslim goes there. But for the Prophet Muhammad, once again, like I said, there's the external and the etern internal. So for him, the inner pilgrimage was more important than the outer pilgrimage. So you go deeper and deeper and deeper, pilgrimage into your own self, until you find the divine that is part of you. You find that God and you are one. God is closer to you than water is to fish. That is the Hajj. That is the pilgrimage, okay? See, the other thing about the pilgrimage for hope and healing, 
See, a pilgrim never stops in spiritual journey and in any other kind of, you know, and then, so you keep going. So you're always encountering a greater. A pilgrim is always going beyond sacred boundaries looking for new horizons, looking for new horizons. Because as soon as a pilgrim stops, then you die. Then you're no longer a pilgrim. So the pilgrimage is a constant, constant growing in our relationship with the divine. <laughs> okay? So these are like, you know, these are the five pillars that will, you know, that will, that will help us. Now, I could go on talking, but you know, how about we stop here, and maybe we'll have some conversations about what I've said, or what, any questions you might have, a comment that you might have. Oh boy, hands are already going up. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> when you see Muslims, like in movies or wherever, I see them praying five times a day, what do the women do? You never see them praying. Women also pray. But they have like a separation of, of men and women in the mosques, you know. And the, and, the, and the reason why they have the separation between men and women in the mosque when they pray is that there are no distractions. Well, are the women in the mosque? Yeah, they'll yeah. be at a separate, different part of the mosque. You know, they, don't, they may not come in the main part of the mosque, but they're always there. Okay, one second. Uh, at the last session, I asked this question and you didn't quite answer it. You told me to ask it again. <laughs> so the question is, what are the commonalities between Buddhism, Hinduism, right. Muslim, and Christianity? Very good. So would you ask that question again? <laughs> no, I'm serious. What I'll do is, maybe the last 10 or 15 minutes, I promise you, I will answer that question because it's a very important question and we need to be able to talk about it. Okay? So, I will. But if I, if I don't answer it, don't let me go. Take me home for dinner. <laughs> I just want to know uh, where all the traditions of wearing the cloth and all that kind of thing come from. I'm gathering it's from those laws or the Sharia. Sharia? Sharia. But anyway, how did that all arise? Okay, that's a good question. See, and the treatment of women in general. Yes. That's even, you know, an even better question. Which is what I mean. Okay. See, the thing is, there is the scriptures, and then there is the practice. Like, if you read the Quran, women not only have an equal place with men, but they have an even, like, more prominent place than men do. Like, there's a tremendous reverence and compassion, you know, for women. And the prophet said, you know, you've got to treat every woman like your mother. And if it were not for, for your mother, you would not be here. You know, that respect and reverence for the woman. Mary, by the way, there are more verses in the Quran about Mary than in the Gospel. So, no, women have a tremendous place in the, like, you know, uh, in the Quran. The Prophet Muhammad treated women with tremendous kind of, you know, they say, well, you know, as long as he was with Khadija, he was like, he just had, he married her. Then after that, he had four wives. But what, what, why were they taking more wives? Because, you know, it's like, it's the same reason why women in India, the Hindu women, would jump into the pyre, into the fire, when their husbands were being cremated. Yeah. Because they were fighting, and if the men died, their women would be taken as slaves, would be raped, would be treated like prostitutes. But rather than kind of letting them go there, one of the Muslim men would marry that woman to protect her, to take care of her. That was ideally. But of course in the Quran, like you know, the, it's also mandated that you can have as many as four wives, provided you treat all of them equally. Now that, like, you know, that goes, I mean, how can you treat four, <laughs> four wives equally? So, I mean, it's difficult to treat one equally. <laughs> four equally. Okay, here is the other thing. So, scriptures, all scriptures treat women, give women a very beautiful place. The practice, because who's in charge of all the religions? Men. You know, and when men take over, yeah, they, 
we men are very insecure. You guys, you guys are more powerful than we are, but we, you've got to know this, you know, so we try to dominate you and, no, you, we think we are winning, but you're inside, you're laughing at us. But anyway, <laughs> but women are, women are more powerful, stronger, and in many ways are, are, are much better. So all this hijab and all these other kinds of things are more cultural, you know, but then they make them absolute. They make them absolute. It's like, you know, like Mother Trees or sisters. Like, they, you know, their dress that they have, right? What was the principle that was behind the dress? It had to be the dress of the poorest of the poor in India. Now, you don't come with that and take it all over the world. You know, that you go bare feet and you go like, no. You got to adapt to the poorest of the poor in wherever you go. But that becomes an, what is, a, what is symbolic and a means now becomes an end. So, like women, the, the, the whole thing about women is more political and cultural and social. It's not religious and it's not. I mean, you know, we give a bad name to the, to the Muslims. You think, like, you know, say women in the, in, the, in the Christian tradition have a better place? Yeah, a better place. But it's like a nominal better place. You know, right now, yes, you are making, your, your, you know, you're making yourself a little more heard and assertive, which is good. And I've always said, you know, I'm not, like, you know, women's ordination is not topmost on my priority. But that women are, like, you know, say, uh, become part and parcel of the everyday running of a church, of a diocese, you know. And they're part of the decision making and the policy, you would have a totally different church. So when people are wearing some Muslims, are less conservative, so they don't ask their women to wear all that stuff. Yeah, it's like, you know, in the Catholic Church, you had to wear your veil, you know, when you came to church. And the first time, like, after Vatican II, they started getting rid of the veils. And my sister got to church, and, you know, she's, a, she's, she's like my better half. So, <laughs> a man came and asked her, where's your veil? So she turned around and she said, and she was in, in high school, and she said, where's yours? <laughs> why, should, why are you asking him my veil? Where is, where is your veil? She just turned around and just snapped at him. So yes, women had to kind of, you know, had to cover their heads and keep their mouth shut. And they blame poor St. Paul for that. And that you need to understand. St. Paul was writing that to one woman, <laughs> not to all women. And you will get somebody, either of, and he told those men, you know, he wrote to those men and said, don't come drunk and don't come here like, you know, like gluttons. Eat at home, drink at home, and then come to the Eucharist over here, but don't make this like, you know, like a, like, like a party where you, all get, where you all get drunk. So, say women, you know, the, the, abuse, the, the abuse of women in this culture is subtle. They're subtle. When I first came to this country, I was shocked. I mean, I never expected. I was down in Shreveport, Louisiana. And I was there, like, you know, a chapter that they took over the parish for about a month. And after some time, like, you know, people got a little familiar with me and they would come in. And there were these, like, you know, petite women with that sudden, like, you know, droll. Oh, my God. It was like... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, and so then they came, they would come and they would talk and then I would have, I would see all these bruises and I asked them, what happened? Are you hurt? He said, well, my husband beats me. And there was this guy who was beating me. <coughs> these men were all there and they were all in the front pews. <laughs> the front pews. And go home and he would beat up his wife and while she was rolling over tables and chairs would make a video recording of her. Oh. And I'm saying, <coughs> And he was probably like, you know, the deacon and very prominent in the, in the church. But anyway, so women, women need to be able to find their place. Not only in the Islamic tradition, but in all traditions. And if we begin to kind of respect women, then maybe like, you know, other cultures will also kind of pick up. They're fighting. They're fighting. And it's not easy. Because these people use power. You know, that is not really helpful. Okay? Yes. You talk about the importance of almsgiving for Muslim. Um, 
How come we don't hear about Muslim-dominated countries when catastrophes happen all over the world? Or you don't hear, is that just a, is that a media thing? They don't talk about the aid that is being sent from other countries? Or, or is it a cultural thing? Or what? Well, you know what? And that's a good question. See, whenever there's been, there have been calamities in this country, you know, 9-11 and other things, there were many Muslim groups that went out there to help people. But they did not go with a, you know, with a block to say, you know, we are Muslims helping. No, they just, and later they were, they had to make themselves known to say, yes, we were Muslims, but we were here to help. So they do help. Now, again, helping one another, helping countries and things like that. See how often helping is, comes with a hook. You know, helping is not always helping. You know, I'm helping because I can control you, I can dominate you, and I can somehow get something back from you. So if it is just generously really helping, that would be a totally different thing. So Muslim countries, do they help one another? I don't really know. I don't really know. But I think that, say for example, like if, when there was, a, there was an earthquake in, in Bombay, outside Bombay, when I first came here, campus ministry of, at St. Louis University could, could, had a collection, you know, they collected a lot of money for the victims of that, uh, uh, the, the earthquake. And so was the Islamic Center on campus collecting money for the victims of the same earthquake. So they were collecting money for, you know, for people in, in like who were in India. So the guy who was in charge of campus ministry came to me and he said, Paul, can you give us the name of a bishop in Bombay so we could send him this money to help our Catholics that are affected by this earthquake? <laughs> so I told him, I said, you know what? I heard that the Islamic community is also collecting money why don't you take your money, give it to them, and tell them to help the Hindus who are affected by this earthquake? You know, Catholic, Muslim, Hindu. So they probably thought I was, I, I mean, I, I, I'm crazy, but you know, not stupid. So, so they would, I would do that. I would do that. So do Muslim kind, you know, I, they, I think they do, but when the, when, when, the, when the political part comes in, then everything gets messed up. Yes? Um, you're doing an excellent job teaching this, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so what is, uh, in the Islamic religion, what do they offer as a resolution? I know in the scriptures we have revelation that kind of ties the story off with the second coming. <coughs> what kind of resolution is offered in their Quran? Oh, the, the, what do you call that? The Muslims also begin to believe in the second coming of Jesus. They believe that Jesus, was, that they believe in the second coming of Jesus. But when he comes, he will preach Islam. <laughs> and those who believe, and what is Islam? There is no God but God. There, there is no God but God. And so he will come, and those who, those who accept him and believe in him, they will go, they will cross the bridge and go on the other side. So that's their, like, you know, but these are all, who knows? I don't know. Yes? But what is the issue with women in education? Because you always hear they don't want the women educated. What is it's that? not true. It's like in certain, like, you know, you're talking about this Malala from in Pakistan. Okay? Now, in certain parts, yeah. Like, you know, I've got what you call it in the same, in Pakistan, I've got these uh, uh, nuns who are friends of mine. Yeah, they are PhDs. They've got, like, you know, I know many Muslim women who are doctors in Pakistan. Oh, by the way, Pakistan had a woman, uh, a prime minister, and a president. Yeah. You know. mm -hmm. So, they that's, might. Wait, but that's right, that's what they said. And then this other group came in and took all their degrees, away, didn't let them be educated. What, what, what is all that stuff? Control, power. Why do you think some of the some of the Hindus, some of the not the Hindus, but some of the landlords in India persecute missionaries because they're educating people? And once you educate somebody, then you fight for your rights. You know, then you fight for your rights, and you kind of you know, then you then you live a different yeah. So it again, it is political, it's cultural, but it's not universal. So there are many women in the Islamic world that are that are highly educated. Okay. Yes. So, I feel like maybe I'm wrong, but there's kind of 
there's not a lot of people speaking about this, educating the American public on this. I don't feel anybody, for me, I don't hear from the Islamic community. How, how, can, how can people get that out? Or, well, it's like you know, it's like the, I hear a lot of the evils of Islam. Yeah, but I don't because hear this. because it's it's what it ha what happens is this. You know, when when we first started this these uh, these uh, talks over here, I talked about inner healing, and then we talked about like you know like family relationships, and we talked about different roles, like you know like dysfunctional roles that we play, and we one of them is scapegoating. So the Western culture needs the Muslim culture to be evil as a scapegoat so we don't have to talk about our problems and our weaknesses because now we are all focused on, you know. Okay, but still I don't hear anybody in the Muslim community standing up and saying, hey, this is my our religion or am I? They try, they do, but they're not, their voice is kind of just smothered. It is being happy. Yes. That's probably Because it is, because it is to the advantage of the media and other people to be able to, you know, to to say evil things about because then you don't have to talk about our weaknesses and our evil. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to that because there's a woman here in St. Louis named Gazella Hyatt mm -hmm. who's a doctor and frequently writes letters to the Post Dispatch about things like that. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yes. The beheadings. I just don't. Right. Right. Again, that's cultural, and that's kind of you know, that goes back to eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And again, it's well. What about execution? The death penalty. It's not. It's not bad. It's not done cruelly, like you know, in public, where you kind of chop off somebody's hand or somebody's head, or you stone them, or you throw them over over the thing. But the death penalty is maybe done in a kind way. I would like to say that um, most of these beheadings are not done by people who are religious. I right. mean, right. that's the whole thing. They're, yeah. They are called Muslims or they're called members of Islam, but they're just murderers. They're mercenaries for the most part. Right. Close to 100% are mercenaries, hired killers. What else do you expect? Well, those are hired killers, but they're also official kind of killers. Like the Inquisition of, well, of the Church. Some of them are official. Like the Inquisition of the Church was the official yeah. like, yes. you know, thing of the Church, where they, you know, the witch hunt, where they got all these women. <coughs> and, and the way, you know how they found out whether they were witches or not. <laughs> well, they just put a, a, a big stone around their neck and threw them in the water. So if they came up, then they were witches. If they did come up, they were not, they were not witches, but they died. <laughs> so. I was just going to say, you mentioned before about the art. And uh, in the middle of September, I think, is they're going to have an opening and then a show at Mokra, which is the Museum of Contemporary right, right, Art. Right. And the artist is a woman who had been a Hindu, who married a Muslim and converted to Muslim, and it is calligraphy in her art. So right, right, right. To be. And when does it open? I, I'm not sure. I think it's like September 15th, maybe, or something. But it's, I know it'll be coming in the middle of September. And I'm glad you mentioned this. See, one other thing you must also know, and I tell all my students this, you know, when you marry, marry a Muslim, you don't marry a Muslim, you marry into the culture. So that's very different about, like, you know, like, and I'm not saying, like, you know, don't, don't marry Muslims, but just know that once you get married to a Muslim, there is no part-time. So you get into, of course, now there are, like, you know, there are Muslims that have grown up, born in the United States, and they are, so they are like, you know, they would not really be considered Muslims by the, you know, but they are, they are, well, they say they're not practicing Muslims. You cannot be a non-practicing Muslim. <laughs> so, but I just, like, so my students tell me, no, you know, this guy is like very modernist. I said, okay, but his mother is not. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's just, it's not to condemn, it's just to understand. That's culture, you know, that's culture. Now, if you're a Hindu, yes, you could be a Hindu and a Christian, you know, you can have a Hindu wedding and a Muslim and a, and a, and a Christian wedding and live happily ever after. 
but not a Muslim. Like, you know, so because they are, again, it's cultural. Okay, anything else? The lady's got a question back there. Great button. The lady's question who asked it at the beginning. Oh, not, not again. Well, it's not yet. Don't forget the hours. That's true. Well, um, I just want to say that I think the talk is just very enlightening and it underscores what I always have believed, which is that ignorance is the root of all evil. Right, 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 right. Well, thank you. you. Say ignorance slash empathy is the root of all evil. Right. Self empathy is the root of all evil. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. I, I, I remember hearing a rabbi talk about how the uh, Jewish people in Spain, I, I don't know if it's Juan Cordoba or the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims, they all got along, and the artwork was just mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But but then I thought it was the Muslims that took over, or everybody, I don't know, but I, I don't know what happened exactly. But the artwork, they talked about how it enriched all the artists, even the yes. artists. Even now, it kind of, you know, see the artwork, the Muslim artwork, the Taj Mahal is, is Muslim. You know, so they've got all these great artworks. But when, and when they live in harmony, yes, art and culture will kind of build. You know, again, there's one of my, one of the things I will do before I die is, and I've already been studying a little bit, the influence of the Islamic tradition on St. Ignatius. You know why? Because Ignatius lived at a time where the Muslims were in Spain for 800 years. So they cannot just be, you know, just, no, there was, there was a lot. So some of the things that he talks about is very Eastern, is very, like, you know, Islamic. Uh, one of the examples is when uh, I went to Spain in Toledo, uh, I visited a, a synagogue. And there was a tour, and the tour was done by a, a guide who worked for the synagogue. And uh, it was a very beautiful uh, interior, and no benches. The only benches were the, uh, along the walls. And then the guide, and it was an American group, so he was speaking English. So he said, if you look up at the corners of, this, of the building, you will see the, the Arabic uh, ideographs. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, originally it was built, the building was built by, by the Muslims. Because we, he said about the Jewish people, we are good doctors, accountants, mm -hmm. but in terms of architecture and building, the Arabs did the work. Then they, they gave the building to the Jewish people. And then it was the, the time, the centuries of Inquisition, and right. very strong <coughs> Catholicism. So uh, three walls in the building were <coughs> with Jewish letters and symbols, and one wall was given to the king and queen of Spain, and they made a beautiful altar. The altar with the with the cross and <coughs> that was, it was a very interesting mixture of three different cultures. Right, right, right. <coughs> Yeah, in Spain you'll find all of that all the time. Okay. Don't forget Taoism, please. Oh, you know what? We'll probably have to keep Taoism for another time. Otherwise, that woman won't let me go. Okay. Okay. You know, because I want to do justice to to Taoism, and in about ten minutes, uh, it might not it might not be the best. But I will answer your question now. Okay. So. Uh, it can still take me to dinner. If you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, what is what are the common elements in all these, you know, all these different, uh, there are all these different traditions that we talked about? One is God. Let's talk about God. You know, what's the common element in God? In Hinduism, God is that. In Buddhism, God is breath, energy. You know, breath is formless. Breath is like, you know, like without any meaning. Breath is God. So just as in Hinduism it's that, in Buddhism it is. In your breathing, you experience the whole universe. Okay? Now in Islam, again, 
God is cannot be named, cannot be written, cannot be cannot, cannot be described. God is beyond, you know, all those things. So the common element in all these is God without images, God without attributes, God who is that. Okay? So can we kind of you know worship one in, with one another? In India we do. In India we do. In fact, the Hindus will come for, you know, they wait for Christmas because they come to, they come to our churches. They love novenas. They will be with, like, you know, but this is the, the popular, the thing. But philosophically, or like, you know, like there is that common element where we just, like what St. Paul will say, there's neither Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female. So we need to come to that. There is a common thing in all these three religions. Okay? And Christianity. Beg pardon? Christianity. Yes. Christianity, there is that, like, you know, like, uh, there are three persons, like one God, then God, you've got to go beyond that. So there are, like, three ways of just transcending in order to experience, yeah, I'm not, yes, yeah, so I talk about Christianity, so, if, okay, let's talk about Christianity, too. Like, for St. Ignatius, you know, God was this luminous whatever, you know, and at the end of his life, Ignatius just experienced God as energy. It was just God who is. You know, being, essence, is, the isness. So it is, but we have to go beyond form, beyond images, beyond genders, beyond like theologies, beyond constructs. You cannot contain God. So all these different traditions will bring us to that, okay? What are the means? Again, when you talk about faith, like faith in Hinduism, again, is a relationship. And that relationship goes through four stages. Words, signs and symbols, presence, presence and absence, until you become one with. So it's a relationship that we grow into, okay? In Buddhism, again, it is, it is a relationship but a relationship that connects us with the entire universe and creation. In Islam, faith is again a relationship. Then they have the means is prayer. Oh, Christianity is also a relationship. But you know, it's a relationship that I say over and over and over again, don't make Jesus an obstacle to your relationship with God, and don't make God an obstacle in your relationship with that. There is something beyond God. So even as a Christian, Jesus came to teach us that God is spirit and God is truth. God is not worshipped on this mountain or in this temple. God is worshipped, the kingdom of God is within. It's not that white old man up there in the sky. The kingdom of God is within, within us. You know, in Islam, God is within, closer to us in our jugular vein. In Hinduism, God is within. Hinduism is Tatmamasi, God is and I am. So I find my identity in the divine essence. Saint Ignatius, you know, he will say, at the end of our life, we become one with God, like the rays of the sun and the sun, the waters of the fountain and the fountain. Like there's no fountain without water. Water is its identity only as being part of the fountain. Therefore, there's no me and you unless we find our identity in that. Okay? So, what are some of the means that, that are given to us? Prayer is in all these different, you know, all the different traditions. And prayer is not an end in itself. Prayer is a means to experience. See, all these traditions, what is, what is, what is important is the experience. And what is experience? In Sanskrit, the word experience is anubhav. Anubhav is to become your essence. Anu is to follow, to become. You know, who is your essence? So you become your essence. And what is our essence? Divine. What is our essence? Like, you know, spiritual. We are part of, you know, the divine essence, God. So our prayer, you know, is our relationship to Him. Okay? Uh, then you have all the... What is sin? Sin in Hinduism is to forget who I am. When all sin, in, like, you know, sin in the, sin in the Bible is to forget who I am. Sin is ignorance. In, in Hinduism, sin is avidya. 
Avidya is ignorance, no knowledge. What is knowledge in Hinduism? To experience the essence of life. And the essence is to find my identity in the divine essence. That is what Mahatma Gandhi's whole movement of Satyagraha is not non-violence. Non-violence is ahimsa. Satyagraha is satya, is the essence. is finding identity in the divine and the interconnectedness of all of life. So whatever happens to one of us affects the rest of us. That is Hinduism. That is Buddhism. That is Jainism. You know? By the way, Mahatma Gandhi was not a Hindu. He was a Jain. Then he followed Hinduism and then he became more universal. Okay? And he learned Ahimsa from the Jain religion. Um, so, um, so what, what was I talking about? So, that, yes, sin. Sin is like, you know, and again, what is the greatest sin in Hinduism? It's to call another human being a sinner. You call another human being a sinner, you cannot commit a greater sin. Because we are made in the image of God, the likeness of God, and our essence is divine. You can condemn what we do, but don't ever call another human being a sinner. You know, we have to separate. That's why one of the things I teach my students also when I'm teaching psychology, you don't call a person a schizophrenic. No, there's a person who has a disease, you know, a disease of schizophrenia. There is no alcoholic. There's a person who suffers from the disease of alcohol. There are no prisoners. There are people in prison. You know, so, but we have to come to this to find our identity as persons and separate it from what we do. So sin, in like you know, in you know, Saint Paul will say. Uh, what does Saint Paul say about sin? Missing the mark, and missing the mark is missing who I am, ignorance. What is sin in the in the, in the third in the Bible in the third chapter of Genesis? Ignorance and and, and without consciousness. And the serpent, my favorite person, the serpent, <laughs> symbol of wisdom, symbol of wisdom, invited the first man and woman, you know, to wisdom to to get, overcome their sin of ignorance and without consciousness, <coughs> without consciousness. You know, read my blog. You probably want to sleep. You'll be excited or you want to sleep. <laughs> I like it. It's like, you know, it's really exciting. So, but I kind of, you know, I've been, I've been working with, a, you know, with this uh, Jewish rabbi and I've been having so much, you know, so, getting, learning so much from this guy. And maybe I'll, I'll, today somebody said, I've got another rabbi who'd like to come and talk to him because he's, so I, so he's, again, but even the rabbi, who's a scholar, is struggling between scholarship and tradition. Mm -hmm. And tradition. It took him a long time to recognize that the serpent was wisdom. Because his tradition made the serpent cunning, evil, bad. Serpent is not bad. The serpent was good till the fifth century. <clears throat> it was only in the fifth century that the serpent was equated with Satan. Until that time, it was wisdom. We worship the serpent. Because we are smart. <laughs> but we don't let the serpent sleep. We wake up the serpent. Because if you let the serpent sleep, then you can do whatever you want. Try doing whatever you want from the serpent. <laughs> <laughs> that is wisdom. Yes? So besides the divine and prayer and sin, how about do good and avoid evil? Yeah. Actually, it's not so much do good and avoid, uh, avoid evil. But it's the golden rule. What's the golden rule? The one who has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> That's also common among all the religions. But the golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the golden rule. So do unto others what you have them do unto you. Now in Confucianism, they turn it the other way around. Don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. It's the same thing, but it's like, you know, it's more, you know, I, I think it is, the confusion way is, is healthier 
than the other way. Because I won't do it to you because then it's manipulation. But if I don't do to you what I don't want you to do to me, that requires more courage. And that is more unselfish. So that is what is common in most kind of phenomena. And love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself, again, is universal. So is organized religion good or bad? <laughs> it's good up to a point. See, we all need organized, organized religion. See, I would never ask parents to kind of bring up your child with no religion. I think it's good to have some foundation of any religion, but, but don't impose it on them. Give it to them and allow them to think. <coughs> Okay, so Meister Eckhart said that every, all of us need religion as a well to take us to the ocean of God's love and God's life. You know, but most people in charge of the well will not allow us to see the ocean and will not get, get us over there. They fortify the well with dogmas, with creeds, and with all these theologies. They beautify it with liturgies, you know, but they don't show us the well. They don't show us the ocean. But the point is, once you reach the, o reach the ocean, do you still need the well? Mm. Or are we still so bound? Now that's kind of, you know, that's, mm. that's, uh, that's scary, but that's a good way to live life. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes? I had a discussion today with a friend, and, you know, we grew up with religion, but I brought my children up in the, in the faith. A lot of kids today aren't going to a religious, um, they aren't right. part of any religion. I wouldn't say they aren't spiritual. You know, I, I see a lot of goodness. But if we say that bringing them up in, a, in some kind of faith is important, then what's the next generation? If this generation isn't going to church... Or Good. And I'll tell you why. You know, Carlo Martini, I don't know whether you know Carlo Martini, he was the Jesuit who would have been Pope. You know, my Jesuit would have been my Pope. The first time John Paul II got shot, if he had died, Martini was walking into the papacy. And he would have been a great Jesuit Pope, you know. Now, before he died, like when Ratzinger was, you know, was, they were was appointed Benedict, they were looking at uh, Martini and they were consulting him. And he said, you know, I'm too old and too sick. He was not as old as Ratzinger, not as sick as Ratzinger, <laughs> but he said, I, that's, it's too late. They wouldn't listen. So what do you think he did? He started walking with a cane. <laughs> so then they gave up. And as soon as Ratzinger was appointed Benedict, he hung the cane on the, on the wall. So there's an article that was written, the cane that changed the papacy. But the reason I'm talking about Martini is this. Before he died, he gave an interview to a Jesuit, and he said, that the church is 200 years behind time. I would say 50, and I thought I was exaggerating. He said it's 200 years behind time. Just look at the church. I mean, which youth that has got, like, you know, some, like the new culture that they're coming up with. You look at the vestments. I mean, look at the vest. What does it, what does it mean to, to young people? What does it mean? Like, what's, what's the meaning of all of that? You know, so there, there has to be either a radical change or there's going to be, there's not going to be a future. Don't you think our new Jesuit Pope is working on it? He is working at it a little too late, a little too kind of, you know, he's painting the Titanic. I have great admiration for him. Great admiration for him for what he's saying, what he's doing, and all, that, all of it. Too late. It's a Titanic. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look around, you know, now he's coming here, he's going to make his wonderful, you know, his wonderful proclamation, but even before he speaks, it's already shut down. You know, so, and maybe, like, you know, so I don't know. Like, you know, this Pope, I really like him, but at the same time, I think it's a little too late for, he's done great changes, he's done wonderful things. And he said things that are, like, that, that, are, that no other Pope would have said. When he says, who are we to judge gays and lesbians? What did he say? Nothing. He did not say that gays and lesbians are okay. He just said, who are we to judge? And that's, you know, I, but he had the courage at least to say what other people have not said. You know, 
So there is a no. I'm not. I'm not running this boat down. I like him, and he's got courage that you know most most other folks have not had. But I'm just. If you ask me, do you think there's a future with this? Like you know, with this folk? I don't think so. And if he's setting himself to be killed, and if he yes. dies, yeah. you know, the next guy, trust me, is going to be a conservative guy. Yes. Yeah. That will come back. Mm -hmm. Yes. But my question is, okay, if we, you have said, um, giving them something to start with. Okay, if the next generation, you know, my, my kids um, aren't going to mass or going to any church necessarily, what about their kids? Am I worried? Uh, I don't think so, but are, or is that background missing? See, what this new generation is looking for is spirituality. In fact, Karl Rahner, Karl Rahner, the great Jesuit theologian, you know, my great admiration for, before he died, he said the future Christian will either be a mystic or nothing at all. And that future Christian is today. And what Rahner said about the Christian is true for people all over the world. In fact, mainland China is also opening its doors to spirituality. They are fostering they are fostering the Tao Te Ching, you know. Lao Tzu's work, spirituality, is what they're fostering. In fact, the, the government organized a meeting of, of Buddhist monks for leaders from different parts of the world, you know, because they're looking for spirituality. Corporations are looking for spirituality. So today's youth, you know, all my students in the class, I mean, they just, like, take anything that I'm saying because I talk to them about spirituality. Like psychology is not like, you know, like the, what do you call it, the scientific study of mental process, human behavior, that's rubbish. The key, the, the root word of psychology is, is soul, is spirit, is the science of the soul, it's the science of the spirit, it's spirituality. Of course it has got to do with mental processes and human behavior, but the root is in the soul, is in the spirit. Yes? And the soul is in everyone. No. Everyone. <laughs> yes. Not only everyone, in everything. Yes. Yes, thank you. All right? Yes? Who are the mystics of today that the youth will be seeing? I mean, I see Richard Rohr, I see you, I see... Well, see, here's a mystic, you know, like, I, like I've told you before, like, you know, when you say, when people ask me, what is mysticism? I said, mysticism is that which begins with mist and ends in scissor. So that's not just, but mysticism for me, a mystic of today is one who can live the fullness of life. All that we were talking about and all these different religions, to have compassion, unity, communion with the rest of the world, that's a mystic. So in that sense, John Paul, like, you know, who is that, uh, Pope Francis, is a mystic. He's trying to be, you know, bring everybody, he's there for world peace. He's there trying to, probably setting himself up to be killed for, you know, to bring people together. And you today, like, look up to him. <coughs> Non-Christians, non-Catholics, non-Christians, look up to the Pope for what he's doing, because he is a mystic, you know. Now, the effects of his mysticism, that's a different story. But if you're saying who's a mystic yet, yeah. you know, my students in my class, they, they were talking about Nelson Mandela in my class only yesterday. He's a mystic. He's the one that brought people, you know, I and mean, he, he prevented this big bloodshed, this, you know, this true fragrance, he brought everybody together. For me, he's a mystic. Now, we need somebody like that. We need, like, you know, another Martin Luther King, another Mahatma Gandhi, another somebody to be able to bring people together. We don't need like movements of resistance and you know and you know all those kinds of things. We need reconciliation. That's a mistake. Okay. I think big about A mystic to me, uh, it, or the definition is knowing God on a personal level through their own addiction. Well, and experiencing interconnectedness of all of life. There are two things. One is like, it's like finding my identity in the divine, knowing God, but also, like what you said, the soul of God is in every creature. Not only humans, but all creatures. All right? Okay, thank you very much. So just look out for an email, maybe.
maybe in a week or two we'll meet together.